So we start in Mark chapter 8 and verses 27 to 30. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. We reach here the end of one line of thought in Mark's Gospel, particularly the early chapters. Very simple question, who is Jesus? It's where Mark begins in chapter 1, verse 1. And again, I'm not going to do every verse in between. But Mark 1, 1 states the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There is a claim made in the very first line of the Gospel, a claim that we are constantly called to test with Mark and his readers and the disciples and the followers and the crowds. And Peter's confession, you are the Christ in Mark 8, is the conclusion to an array of opinions and evidence that is presented to us. John the Baptist, right at the beginning, testifies to one who would baptize with the Spirit. God the Father speaks at the baptism of the Son that he loves. In chapter 1, verse 24, the demon declares him to be the Holy One of God. The teachers of the law infer a divine claim when he forgives sin. Jesus himself declares he's the Lord of the Sabbath. His family believe he's out of his mind. The teachers of the law then say he's possessed by Satan. By the end of the chapter 4, when he stills the wind and the waves, the disciples simply ask, who is this? Beginning of chapter 5, we see the demons have worked it out. Son of the Most High God. In fact, through the early chapters of Mark, there is one group who consistently, accurately identifies Christ, and it is the demons. One suspects a degree of frustration in Jesus and his disciples at various points. In chapter 6, he comes to them walking on the water, and they believe he's some kind of phantasm. From our theological perspective, Mark's evidence seems clear. And we don't only go with Peter in confessing him to be the Christ, but confess him to be all sorts of other things as well. But I'm not sure that we are to start with our conclusions. That seems to be a strange method to take. Rather, we're asked to consider what is before us with the disciples as they consider their experience. And while we're only halfway through Mark's Gospel in chapter 8, we're a lot further through Jesus' ministry. This is the point at which he turns his face to Jerusalem and begins that walk to the cross. And so if Jesus' ministry was about three years long, we're probably well over two and a half years into the ministry. A ministry of miracles, a ministry of teaching, a ministry of casting out demons, and people still having the foggiest who he is. Peter manages to make a confession, but the crowds have some, let's be honest, pretty weird suggestions. Prophet, pretty solid, not bad. Elijah, creative marks, you know, marks for creativity there. But John the Baptist, his own cousin, Uh, That's a strange one. And I'm challenged by this journey. I think it's a challenge to us and certainly to our churches to place our theology of Christ on one side and to enter in a place of wondering and exploring with the disciples who is Jesus the Messiah. And rather than seeing him still the wind and the waves and say, "Mm, that sounds about right, it's kind of what I'd expect. Rather to be amazed at the power that is at work in him. So we've journeyed to this point, from a man being baptised through to this confession of Peter, that we can agree with that Christ is the Messiah, the one anointed by God. And so, to this point, our understanding has grown steadily, based on the evidence, and blossomed in this tiny little bit of knowledge, bearing in mind his authority over demons, over nature, over sin, in his teaching, It has grown to this point and this confession. But how much further can it grow? He is the Messiah. He is the one who will bring salvation, bring victory for God's people. So far we've seen individual lives transformed, groups challenged, crowds fed. How much further can it go? I'm just going to pause very briefly. Just close your eyes. Think about what we've seen in the last two and a half years. Christ casting out demons, Christ healing the paralytic and forgiving his sins, 
feeding 5,000, calming the storm, walking on water. Wonder with the disciples at who you understand Jesus to be in all this power and authority. What glory awaits? Mark 8, 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. What glory? Strange glory. Jesus' ministry has raised his status in the eyes of his disciples, as that power at work through him has done marvellous things, bringing healing, freedom, sustenance, faith to others. Jesus is the anointed one of God. But what this means for Jesus is a life of service for others, culminating in a sacrificial death. This should shock us. Shock Peter. If it doesn't shock us, we've lost the heart of what we're reading and somehow resurrection victory has blinded us to the text. Resurrection's there. Christ says he will rise again in three days, but I'm not sure that Peter is focusing on that part of Jesus' speech. But once our theology categorizes God as simply supreme and Jesus as God, it's hard to recover the covenantal relational core of the revelation of God in Scripture. There's a vulnerability implicit in Jesus' resolution to go to Jerusalem to die. And it's not a new theme in the revelation of God's action. Throughout the Old Testament, we see the impact on God of the faithlessness of his created people his chosen people, and his continued faithfulness at a cost to himself as his name is dishonoured in the lives of his people in the sight of the nations around. What a God we worship. What a revelation of God's self to us in this intense switch from a culmination in the recognition of Jesus' identity to the humiliation of his approaching death. We sit, stand, kneel in worship in this irreconcilable tension between the power and the majesty that is revealed and the vulnerability that accompanies God's creative and redemptive actions. With Christ at the heart of any Christian theology, the pre-incarnate word through whom all things were created, the infant dependent on his mother, the miracle worker, the suffering saviour on the cross, the risen and ascended Lord, our study should always begin and end in worship because we can only wonder, we can never fully comprehend. Let's spend some time worshipping our God. We return to Mark. Uh, And in the first part, we were looking at Jesus in Mark 8 as the supreme revelation of God in his relationship to and his action in creation. And there was the challenge to avoid simplifying God to a being we could easily comprehend, who would act as we might expect, but to remain in that state of wonder that the Bible leads us to in the story of Jesus. In the second section, building on this basis, but looking beyond this chapel and this particular act of worship to the lives that we are called to live, our focus is on Jesus as the supreme revelation of humanity, as the Spirit-anointed children of God. Mark 8, 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, 
he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. There's a passage. How we read it, I think, depends greatly on our circumstances. For the first century church, and for much of the church through history, this is a passage of great affirmation and comfort. If you are lacking in worldly goods, if you're wondering why you're being persecuted and whether you can stand firm in the faith, here is Jesus not only promising the life you live, but showing that it's the pa- following the pattern that he has set. So if I was speaking into that context, the message would be one of reassurance that their lives of poverty and suffering are not signs of failure, but of faithfulness. In that context, the concept of following Christ is pretty clear, since it necessarily involves the whole of your life. If you're in danger of losing your life, you might as well give all of it and commit with a holistic dedication. In the West today, we've ended up with a rather complicated approach to following Christ, confused by our history, by our theology, and by our spirituality. And one result is that these verses that should be so stark and simple in their convicting power can be read and used by churches with no discernible impact on people's faith lives. They are not used to inform our lives, but to reflect on our experience and lose their power as a result. I think it's useful, very briefly, just to highlight a couple of the factors that have made it difficult for us to read these verses well. For most of Western church history, the vast majority of Christians have had neither the capacity nor the encouragement to be active participants in the church. Faith was done primarily to them rather than by them. This comes out of centuries of illiterate agrarian societies, but later Christianity has not taken good steps to reverse this shift back to a participation that we see in the early church. We've stayed in a posture of observation, primarily. Common in the historic churches and Protestant churches have done little to reform this aspect of the church. And this has effects on what it means to follow Jesus. It makes following Jesus a posture of heart and mind, rather than an imitation of Christ in our sacrifice of self for others. Our identity is received. It is stamped on us. We become approved creations rather than new creations. Our lives plus the Spirit rather than lost lives for the gospel that saves us. And in this model, even when we do participate more in our faith lives, as we've been encouraged to do in recent decades, we still make implicit and often explicit decisions about how much we will give up different aspects of our lives for the gospel. And so taking up our crosses is applied reflectively to struggles that we go through, rather than foundationally as a deliberate approach to life. We are part Christians, giving up certain things, some time, some activities, what John Wesley calls half Christians, which are in danger of not being Christians at all. No, uh, oh yes, good. I was afraid that Annie was going to switch the slides, but she was right not to. We need to reconsider what following Christ means as a church under the lens of Christ himself. We saw earlier how Christ's identity was shown through the power evidenced at being at work in and through him. He had authority in his teachings, he healed the sick, he cast out demons. And the twelve have already experienced something of this element of following Jesus when they were sent out, driving out demons, anointing sick people with oil, and healing them. And the rise of charismatic Christianity has seen an emphasis on this element of following Jesus in a desire for participation in the faith that we profess. And we trust 
that when people see the Spirit at work in these ways through us, they will recognize Christ in us as the ambassadors of God. What happens when they confess our Christ-likeness and they worship God and they resolve to follow Christ? To what extent are we followers of Christ? Can we authentically say to these people that we, and they, if they choose to follow, must suffer many things, must be rejected by those around us? Can we ask them to take up their crosses, to lose their lives? To what extent do our lives evidence this? With all the authority that Christ received from the Father, with all the power that was at work through him for the good of others, The result for Christ was a walk to the cross. We seem to want to seek to follow Christ in being open to the power that is at work in us and through us. We love the empowering spirit. We don't always recognise that this is to enable us to serve others rather than for our own benefit. The result is that much of our lives seems to accord more with Peter's rebuke of Jesus than with Jesus' self-sacrifice and our sacrifice as we follow him. We recognise the Spirit's presence with us, empowering us. We recognise we are Spirit-anointed. When Christ says this means we must be rejected and take up our crosses, our lives and our prayers rebuke him. We do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. When faced with difficult times, We pray for release rather than for faithfulness, to save our lives rather than to take up our crosses and follow Jesus. The God revealed in Jesus is not the God of the world or even sometimes the God found in the church. We talk about his power and majesty more easily than we talk about his humility regarding what he has created. The life of God's children revealed in Jesus is not attractive to the world or emphasised in the church. We focus on life in the spirit, on the work that God can do in and through us. But to follow in Jesus' steps carrying our own cross, losing our lives for the gospel seems to get left out. It is appropriate with this passage that we come to communion together. And we will do that shortly. But I'm just going to leave a little bit of space for some contemplation here. I mentioned Wesley's issue with half-Christians earlier. Here's a little aid to our thinking and prayers from his writings. Let the Spirit return to the God that gave it, with all of its affections. He doesn't want any other sacrifices from us, but has chosen the living sacrifice of the heart. Let it be continually offered up to God through Christ in flames of holy love. And do not let any creature share his place, because he is a jealous God. He will not share his throne with another. He will reign without a rival. Let no plan or desire be admitted there, except what has his glory as its ultimate goal. to spend some time thinking about the crosses that we are called to take up, the lives that we are called to lose as we follow Jesus.